Bonjour, Wache and Aine. Welcome to Lycate University's Global Indigenous Speaker Series, Revitalizing Indigenous Languages with guest speaker Eli Baxter, entering the eighth buyer prophecy. We are happy that you're able to join us today. Denise Baxter, Indigenous Makwadodam, Martin Falls, and Donjaba. My name is Denise Baxter, Vice Provo Indigenous Initiatives at Lycate University, and I will be your MC for the event today. Lakehead remains committed to social justice and social responsibility. Lakehead University will continue to advance the Truth and Reconciliation Commission Calls to Action and Universities Canada Principles on Indigenous Education. We respectfully acknowledge that our campuses are located on the traditional lands of Indigenous peoples. Lakehead Thunder Bay is located on the traditional lands of Fort William First Nation, and Wajou, signatory to the Robinson Spear Treaty of 1850. Lake Hedorilia is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, which includes the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi nations, collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. Lake Hed University acknowledges the history that many nations hold in the areas around our campuses and is committed to a relationship, a strong relationship with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples based on the principles of mutual trust, respect, reciprocity, and collaboration in the spirit of reconciliation. Uh, before we begin today, I would just like to run through a few housekeeping items. Uh, you may note that this event is being recorded today, and uh, it will be available up on our website um, shortly, within the next couple of days. And we'll also email you a link of the, the finalized copy for you if you wish to review or share uh, with your friends. And we are doing this to preserve a record of the event uh, in the university's archives and to publicize and promote Lakehead University. By attending or agreeing to be included in the recording and its public dissemination in media now known or you know ever in perpetuity. All participants are muted to ensure seamless continuity throughout the event. And we will have an opportunity to have a question and answer period at the conclusion of the lecture. So if you have any questions, if you could please put them in the chat throughout as you think of them, just put them in there. And then I'll, I'll moderate these closer to the, the end of our time. Uh, we will be finishing at 1 p.m. today. So we have a, a nice solid hour with uh, Eli and um, we look forward to that. And it is now my pleasure to introduce Elder Jean Nawagizik from Kiyoski Zaging and Anishinaabek, who will be sharing our opening prayer for today. Welcome, Elder Jean. Good morning. To be good, um, Denise. And uh, I'd like to welcome my friend, Eli. Uh, nice to see you. Doing well. Uh, also, just say a um, short prayer and get the, the show moving. Mission, <laughs> Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. There we go. for sharing with us and opening us in a good way today. And it is nice to see you, even though I know you're a little bit north of us, um, but it's great to see your smiling face again. So thank you for joining us. It is now my pleasure to introduce our president and vice chancellor, Dr. Maureen McPherson, to share a few comments. Dr. McPherson. Thank you very much, Denise, and also Chimigwech, Elder Jean, for your opening today and for opening so many of our speaker series events in uh, such a good way. And it's my great pleasure to welcome everyone here today to our third lecture this year in Lakehead University's Global Indigenous Speakers Series. Today's title is Revitalizing Indigenous Languages. 
Uh, this year's speaker series aims to draw attention to the critical state of many Indigenous languages by inviting and engaging with language warriors from around the world so they may share with us their important work to preserve, revitalize, and promote these languages. And our series, I misspoke a little bit earlier, our series is actually a series this year focused on revitalizing Indigenous languages. Today, we are very honored to welcome Eli Baxter. Eli is an Anishinaabe knowledge keeper, a fluent Ojibwe speaker, and an Ontario certified teacher. We are proud to call him an alumni of Lakehead. Eli graduated from Lakehead University in 1986 with a Bachelor of Arts degree. He wrote and taught Anishinaabe language and cultural studies at Western University. He has taught in the language program for the Chippewas of the Thames First Nations Elementary School now for 20 years. And he taught the adult graduate equivalency degree program for the Oneida Nation. In 2022, Eli won the Governor General's Literacy Award for his nonfiction book titled Aki Wenze, A Person Worthy as the Earth. Please join me today in warmly welcoming Eli Baxter. Migrets and Migrets, Denise, at this way, I got you kit to you. At this way, Migrets and the kid, Jean, Gagipi, Gagipi, and the Snabby, MCG. At the Dr. McPherson. Miigwech, Miigwech, Kit Ma, Kne Ayayig. Any Bindige young Niswe Ishkote. I'd like to say thank you to uh, Denise and uh, uh, Jean, uh, an old friend of mine, Kitche uh, Uchi <laughs> Wagon. At the Ske, Dr. McPherson, and also uh, Anna Chief uh, for uh, putting this on. At the Ske, uh, everybody that's also involved at uh, uh, Lakehead University. And uh, <laughs> I remember uh, starting out at uh, Lakehead uh, University uh, a long time ago. And I was very, very shy, I remember that. And uh, uh, somehow I got through it with uh, a lot of help from uh, family and friends. And also uh, the other in the Schnabig that took the, that, uh, that course. And uh, I also uh, mentioned any Bindi Gay Young, this way is good uh, what I'll be talking about today is uh, entering the Eighth Fire uh, Prophecy. And uh, uh, I'd like to say miigwech, uh, thank you to Kakina and to Maganag, to all my relations, all my relatives. Kakina uh, and Shabig. All the people. Kakina Pioteg, Omai Governor Matabwach Kirinoa. At this, Pioteg is visitors or strangers. That's, I don't know. And also, Kakina Memegasa Sag. Also to the, the little people. And also, Kakina Gaginoa Manitog. Uh, also to the to the spirits that uh, that are here with us uh, on Anishinaabe land. Uh, also, Migrech Nindikit Kakina Awane Nag Kabinamatabwach Chibizindamwach Owe Anishinaabe Kendaswin like to uh, say thank you to all the people that are, that uh, have come and 
to sit uh, with us uh, to uh, to learn about uh, uh, a small thing, I, I guess, uh, of uh, just a fraction of Anishinaabe Kandaswin, which is uh, Anishinaabe knowledge. Atash any bindi gang this way ish kute. We are uh, entering uh, the eight fire prophecy of the Anishinaabeg. Uh, just to uh, give you a little bit of background, I am uh, an Anishinaabe person, the Anishinaabe meaning the people, and my uh, uh, I guess a lot of people don't like the word to, uh, don't like to, the use of the word tribe, but I'm with the uh, Anishinaabe uh, tribe of uh, the Ojibwe, which is the traditional name of the Ojibwe in Inuit, the people that write. Uh, we have uh, uh, we have a writing system, and that's what the other tribes have uh, have, uh, have called us and still do uh, call us. And uh, uh, the Eight Fire Prophecy is uh, a prophecy that, uh, that uh, a lot of uh, Anishinaabe uh, know about, heard about, uh, and it's been around for, uh, for a very uh, long time, especially within the Anishinaabe community, Anishinaabe uh, uh, communities uh, all over Michigan, Minnesota, uh, 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 here on Turtle, Turtle Island. And uh, the thing is that uh, because we are entering the Eighth Fire, uh, we, uh, we are just uh, uh, finishing the, the Seventh Fire uh, Prophecy. And the seven five prophecy basically uh, uh, talks about uh, the coming of uh, uh, the European race uh, uh, into uh, Anishinaabe uh, uh, into Anishinaabe land. And these uh, prophecies they uh, they last uh, uh, a quite a number of years actually. So for the coming of the, of the European uh, people, uh, it's been about uh, over uh, 500 years. So uh, during the seventh fire, uh, we, uh, our uh, elders knew that uh, the Europeans were gonna come. And this was uh, predicted uh, by uh, uh, seven spirits. Now, we must uh, remember the history of the Anishinaabe. And the Anishinaabe, uh, we all, before European contact, we all lived, uh, let's say, right from uh, Labrador, what is now Labrador, all along down the eastern uh, seaboard, uh, which is now. Uh, the maritime provinces, and also uh, right up to the Florida uh, Panhandle. Now, all of those tribes uh, that lived there are still living there now. And they're all Anishinaabe, uh, except for the Haudenosaunee, uh, the Six Nations. Okay, uh, we also uh, lived with them uh, along the eastern seaboard uh, at that time. And uh, this is where uh, the, uh, it was about, uh, in some of the stories that we have, uh, it was about uh, these seven spirits that came to our lodges, our uh, spiritual uh, lodges along the Eastern Seaboard uh, a long time ago. That's maybe about uh, half a century. Uh, before the arrival of the uh, of the Europeans, that uh, the elders uh, uh, in uh, in a, in the villages uh, at that time, 
uh, talked about this, uh, these seven spirits that came and, and told the Anishinaabeg there that, they, that we had to move from the Eastern sea, uh, Seaboard and move inward and move to where the, uh, you know, uh, where the plants grow in the water. So it took uh, uh, a number of years to, uh, to migrate because some people refused to go. Uh, 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 they said they would stay in these villages, but a whole bunch of uh, Anishinaabe moved uh, west until we found the uh, wild rice uh, growing uh, on, the, on the water. So that was the food growing in, in the water. And so there was, uh, so there's that, uh, that prophecy uh, that uh, we, we know that we had to, uh, uh, we had to move. Uh, so uh, that's why we have Anishinaabe big living uh, all the way from, you know, foothills of the Rockies uh, all the way to the west, I'm uh, oh, sorry, to the east coast. Uh, uh, Turtle Island uh, presently. And uh, now the seventh uh, fire talks about uh, us uh, living with uh, uh, the Europeans, all the settlers that are uh, living here now. And uh, uh, so uh, at, the, at that time, uh, we uh, uh, we had uh, we developed a, a nation to nation relationship with uh, uh, with the Europeans uh, with all the nations that uh, that came uh, that came uh, that came over and. Uh, at that time, uh, we still uh, had uh, our, our our language and our and our teachings and Nishnabe Kendaswa. And uh, there was uh, a talk about uh, there is uh, a talk about the, the eighth uh, uh, the eighth fire. And uh, this uh, this prophecy, and remember that these prophecies uh, come from our, uh, our grandfather's uh, spirits uh, in the, in the spirit world, and they communicate with our uh, elders uh, in the uh, in our ceremonies, in our traditional uh, uh, traditional ceremonies, and so. When they started talking about uh, the eighth fire uh, uh, prophecy, uh, they, they're saying like, uh, my generation, uh, uh, we are the ones that are responsible uh, to, uh, to talk about and uh, teach uh, about the eighth fire prophecy, and uh, what the eighth fire prophecy says is that uh, the Anishinaabe and the uh, uh, First Nations people here on Turtle, uh, on Turtle Island will have to uh, teach uh, everybody. Uh, natives and non-natives uh, here on, here on Turtle Island, about uh, the consequences of uh, this new way of life that uh, that we have, and it's about uh, change uh, of uh, the way we do things, how we live uh, uh, on on the land because uh, Anishinaabe First Nations people. In our teachings, uh, our, uh, and our responsibilities have always been to the land, uh, to the water, to the air. 
and because we are a part of it and uh, we cannot live without the water, cannot live without the animals. And uh, so, and also the plants uh, are, are Anishinaabe uh, medicines. So, uh, what the elders uh, talk about, and what they tell us, is that uh, the Anishinaabe and the non native people uh, in uh, entering the eighth fire is that we have to go back and uh, uh, relearn and also teach for us that know, uh, teach about the Anishinaabe, Kikendaswa, uh, uh, Anishinaabe knowledge of how to look after uh, the plants, uh, uh, the animals, uh, how to live the Anishinaabe Bumatizuan, okay, Mino uh, people call it, which is uh, living the good life at that, uh, uh, at that, uh, that, that lifestyle that the Anishinaabe had before, here before European contact. And uh, so, we all must uh, remember what it was like here on this land before European contact. We had trees that uh, that were that grew so thick that if you have twelve people holding hands uh, encircling a tree, uh, it would take about twelve people uh, to to make a complete circle around the trunk of those uh, of those trees a long time ago. And at that time, there was no need for us. Uh, uh, at that time, there was no need for uh, for for us to cut down the trees uh, or, or anything like that. Uh, for for us anyway, because we had all the stuff that we needed to live uh, uh, to live with the land. We had our medicines, we had our food, and uh, you must remember that uh, in our stories. Uh, the lakes were just full of uh, fish, huge, uh, huge fish. And uh, we had uh, all sorts of uh, ducks and uh, waterfowl uh, to, to eat. We had uh, deer, moose that lived uh, uh, the uh, eastern uh, with us at the eastern seaboard so uh, we had our, uh, uh, our medicines and, the, and our way of life and uh, remember that uh, our way of life uh, a long time ago was uh, it was well organized and uh, we uh, we had our own education system. We had our own uh, healthcare system, uh, and it was so good that we never developed any hospitals. There was never any hospitals uh, when the Europeans came here. Uh, there was no jails uh, when the Europeans uh, uh, came here. And uh, there was uh, uh, basically uh, we we don't have a word for uh, suicide uh, in our in our language. Uh, the, that concept uh, wasn't uh, uh, wasn't in our vocabulary. So. Uh, so what I'm trying, uh, what I'm saying is that uh, presently here we are at a changing point where we have to decide, uh, you know, to teach uh, our Anishinaabe uh, knowledge uh, to everybody and anybody that would listen in order to save uh, to save the planet uh, from uh, from destruction. 
as uh, as we all know, climate change is uh, is uh, is uh, is here now. A lot of people are dying. Uh, a lot of people are being misplaced uh, by the floods, the fires uh, that that are upon us uh, now. And that is what the eighth uh, fire prophecy was uh, was talking about. And uh, uh, what they say is that we're on a road now, what we're presently on, uh, 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 living uh, on the planet. And then uh, because of our li uh, present lifestyles, we are uh, basically uh, hurting uh, the planet and the planet is, is healing itself. Remember uh, that us in uh, uh, we, uh, we know that the planet is a living thing. Uh, plants, animal, uh, uh, things that are considered inanimate in the, uh, the non-native world uh, for us, uh, First Nations people, uh, the, the inanimate objects we we consider as uh, uh, animate, ha as living things. Even uh, you know, a snake, uh, uh, rocks, uh, mountains, and, uh, trees, uh, water is a living thing because. Uh, if water doesn't move, uh, it becomes stagnant. Uh, and then it uh, uh, basically dies. Uh, so uh, all of these uh, entities uh, uh, that we live with in the Anishinaabe world, uh, we, uh, we consider them having spirits and uh, a lot of uh, uh, Anishinaabe people uh, have uh, a spiritual relationship to the animals, to the plants, uh, to the water, uh, and all the spirits that live uh, within those living things. And so uh, a lot of people uh, talk about this, we're, we're on this road, and then there is uh, going to be two roads that, uh, that we that we come upon, that, you know, that whole, you know, saying about the fork on, uh, on the road and, you know, what do you do with, when you come up to a fork on the road? And, uh, yeah, people say that, uh, you know, uh, an Anishinaabe person would pick up that fork and take it home. <laughs> uh, but uh, the fork on the road, yeah. Which uh, uh, which road do we uh, which road do we, uh, do we take? Uh, the present one that we're on right now, where there is a lot of uh, destruction that's uh, that's happening now, and that is going to happen uh, in the, uh, in the future. So if you take a look at the at the change of uh, uh, the weather pattern. Uh, all the fires uh, in the west, uh, on the west coast, as uh, far uh, California, uh, BC. And uh, also you have all these fires. But then again, when the fires uh, die out, and the reason why they die out is because of the atmospheric uh, rivers that are now uh, drenching uh, the west coast and causing floods and landslides uh, all, uh, all over the place. And this has, uh, has never happened before. And we're seeing it and we're experiencing it uh, uh, right now uh, with uh, a lot of people uh, uh, losing their lives. And also uh, changing the landscape, uh, the, the you know the trees dying because of thirst and the plants uh, that uh, that are there, 
And then also, if you take a look at the water systems in the, in in America, uh, all the lakes and rivers there are just uh, drying up, and pretty soon, uh, temperatures are going to uh, go higher and higher, and uh, you know those lakes and rivers are just going to evaporate, and uh, it's. Uh, uh, a, a dire uh, prediction, but but now uh, we're we're seeing uh, the water levels going down really really low, almost drying up in some in some uh, spots, and that's just not here, but uh, it's all across, like you know, in Australia and uh, New Zealand, and also going into Europe, uh, uh, the. Uh, the planet itself is uh, uh, is healing itself because it's uh, we're uh, hurting it uh, with our uh, our present uh, lifestyle uh, actually and so uh, things uh, uh, things have to uh, uh, things have to change uh, our lifestyle actually uh, has to has to change our way of thinking towards uh, uh, nature uh, has to uh, uh, has to change and so uh, we must uh, uh, we must all think about uh, you know what uh, what the heck are we going to do uh, with uh, with all this uh, climate change that's uh, that's going to that's going to happen? Okay, uh, Anishinaabe prophecies. Uh, you know, uh, do we believe in this like eighth fire uh, prophecy? And uh, as Anishinaabe people uh, ourselves. And uh, you know how we are, uh, how we ourselves racing towards uh, uh, destruction uh, uh, ourselves without uh, you know uh, going back and relearning our our Anishinaabe knowledge from way way back, and how do we get this Anishinaabe knowledge again? I've always said this, and I've always, and in my book, uh, Akiwenze, a person as, uh, as uh, worthy as the earth, uh, I use the Anishinaabe Ojibwe language uh, as uh, part of the book. And uh, this is just to uh, tell people that we still have the language up north and that. Uh, we need to have that language back, and it needs to be taught in uh, in all communities the way it was taught to us. As I've as I've uh, written in the book, the way that my generation, uh, the way we were taught by our parents, is uh, not in the school setting uh, as what we have now. And I think we've had this uh, school setting teaching the language for about 50 years now, and there's not one single fluent speaker uh, came out of that program. And so that, uh, so that has to change because uh, we are not getting our, uh, none of the students are getting the, uh, the fluent uh, at so can. Uh, uh, the fluent uh, traditional uh, Anishinaabe stories that we all grew up with and the people that still know the language uh, uh, went through what I went through uh, in learning in, in learning that the Anishinaabe language is through these uh, through our stories uh, at Sokanan uh, Atsukan is, uh, is the story that teaches everything. 
Right, that's our curriculum uh, in, uh, in the Anishinaabe Kendaswan and also our Anishinaabe uh, education system. We, uh, we need to bring this back, but it has to come from the land. Uh, just the way when we were all growing up uh, before we went to residential school, uh, our parents uh, taught us uh, in the language. That's all we learned. Uh, that's all we uh, that's all we talked uh, in uh, as we were growing up. And it was always through uh, uh, observing our parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles, and our older siblings that know the language. And we mimicked them, we copied them. We uh, always wanted to be like them. So uh, growing up, that's what uh, uh, all of us did, uh, especially uh, uh, at that time period in the, in the 40s, 50s, uh, early 60s in these Northern communities before we went to residential school and all these Northern uh, communities in all, in all our pro uh, Canadian provinces. Uh, and that's why that language is still, uh, uh, is still kept alive by uh, some communities, uh, uh, community members uh, that still follow uh, uh, the ways of the hunting and gathering societies of the Anishinaabe. And uh, what we lost was, uh, or what we are losing right now, is uh, these uh, students at the, in the classroom setting where the language is taught, is they're missing uh, this whole Anishinaabe uh, curriculum, Anishinaabe acad uh, acad uh, academics, uh, I guess, uh, that, that is within our languages. And so, uh, one of the things I drew, but I proposed, uh, uh, whoever uh, listens uh, when I talk about this, is that every community uh, uh, needs to have the language being taught, uh, and especially to the elders uh, uh, that's, that don't know the language because of residential school, and also the, uh, uh, the younger people that want to learn the language and uh, uh, learn it the way that we learned it as we were growing up. Well, we need to have uh, uh, Anishinaabe uh, uh, programs, initiatives uh, that takes the kids and the adults that want to learn the language back to the land and teach everything on the land, off the land. Uh, because uh, uh, our language holds uh, uh, all of that uh, uh, knowledge, Anishinaabe knowledge, that we need to that we need to have uh, as we uh, uh, enter the the eighth fire prophecy, so that we can uh, 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 live and learn and teach uh, about our Anishinaabe, uh, our Anishinaabe ways. Now, uh, there are some other prophecies that are, uh, just to uh, give you an uh, example of some uh, Anishinaabe prophecies. Uh, the Anishinaabe and also the uh, uh, people of uh, the Sioux, and uh, they had a prophecy of the coming of the white buffalo. So there was that, and there was a white buffalo that was born in one of the farms in the States. So there was a prophecy about that. And there was a prophecy by the Anishinaabe a long time ago that one day uh, an eagle was, was going to land on the moon. And uh, when the... Uh, when the United States uh, uh, module uh, uh, spacecraft landed on the moon, 
uh, one of the first things that were that was said was the eagle has landed. So there was that. So there's that uh, that prophecy of uh, the Anishinaabe a long time ago that an eagle will land on the moon. So there there's that. And there is also uh, a prophecy uh, that the Oneidas have. Now, uh, when I came down and lived uh, here in the uh, London area uh, to teach uh, at Chippewa of the Thames, I taught there for 20 years uh, the Anishinaabe language from JK to grade eight. And then uh, I did some uh, other uh, work uh, with uh, uh, in education, doing a native language program. Uh, also, I, uh, I ended up uh, teaching uh, the GED program uh, the general uh, education uh, program, GED uh, diploma that they have. And my students uh, used to call it the uh, the good enough uh, diploma, <laughs> the GED program. And I would talk uh, with the uh, with my students, uh, uh, the adult. Uh, uh, elders uh, uh, in uh, the community of, uh, of Oneida. And Oneida is part of uh, uh, a tribe of the Six Nations and uh, fascinating history that uh, stories uh, that, that they have. And I was talking to uh, a couple of the elders and so one of the elders told me this prophecy that the Oneidas had and the prophecy about uh, uh, that they talk about is that uh, one day uh, the whole weather system is going to change where uh, the uh, uh, Florida, uh, uh, that uh, area there, uh, is going to uh, experience winter, like our winters, uh, one of these uh, one of these days, and uh, it's starting to happen now. Actually, if, if you uh, uh, if you see the the weather that's happening, uh, the iguanas are falling off the trees because it's so cold. Uh, in, uh, sometimes uh, uh, in Florida, and also uh, they are, uh, in their prophecy, the Oneida prophecy, they say that the uh, the climate here uh, in our territory is going to be like what Florida is uh, is experiencing now. You know, the the nice weather. Uh, all year round and stuff like that. So it's going to, uh, it's going to reverse, uh, the weather pattern is going to reverse somehow, which, uh, which is, uh, you know, I don't know if it's going to be good for us, but <laughs> we like our winters uh, here, uh, some of us. And uh, so, uh, so they have that, uh, uh, they also have that, uh, prophecy that uh, that uh, that uh, I was uh, you know told about it uh, a long time ago by by one of them and uh, so there are those uh, stories or teachings uh, uh, these uh, uh, prophecies uh, that uh, that we do have uh, or because of our uh, uh, Anishinaabe uh, knowledge. And uh, one of the things that uh, I'm really concerned about right now 
uh, is uh, this whole thing about uh, the ring of fire, uh, especially around uh, uh, Thunder Bay, north of Thunder Bay, and also in the, uh, the traditional Anishinaabe Bay uh, ancestral uh, territory uh, of the Anishinaabe. And uh, it's, uh, uh, I've had concerns about it since the, uh, uh, when they announced, when Dalton McGinty announced the, uh, the findings of the minerals of the Ring of Fire and how, it, how it's go it was going to change uh, the economy of the Canadian uh, landscape, and also, uh, you know, how, it's, how it was going to benefit the Canadians and uh, uh, people in cities, uh, and also in, uh, you know, the Canadian children uh, in the future. So, you know, I think, yeah, okay. Uh, so I'm thinking, uh, how come he never mentioned anything about Anishinaabe, <laughs> how they're going to be affected, and also the Anishinaabe, Anishinaabe uh, children, uh, Anishinaabe Awashag. Uh, he never mentioned uh, any, you know, how that uh, was going to affect uh, affect us uh, with the discovery of these all these minerals. Uh, the thing about the Ring of Fire, which is Nabinjipizan uh, Ishkote uh, Ring of Fire, is uh, I hear about all this talk about all these minerals, how it's going to save the planet uh, because uh, it's going to give us all these minerals for electric cars and, uh, you know, chromite, how it was so good. You know, the mineral is going to be so good for stainless steel and uh, all of these uh, minerals that are needed to, you know, to save the planet. And so things like that and, you know, uh, Doug Ford wants to uh, jump into, uh, onto a tractor uh, himself, a bulldozer, and make a road uh, into our territory. So uh, I'm thinking, oh no, uh, you know, we don't want Doug Ford uh, on the bulldozer uh, going up into, into the territory because him and the bulldozer are, are going to disappear into the musket and they're never to be seen again. So that was uh, a, a concern of the Anishinaabe. <laughs> you know, and I'm thinking, oh geez, that's going to be a waste of a good bulldozer if that happens. Uh, as I said, uh, with, uh, with the Ring of Fire, uh, all of these, uh, you know, really, really good uh, things that's going to happen with, uh, you know, with the economy and uh, stuff like that. But then us in Ishnabeg, we all say, be having a ma, be having a ma. I said, hey, you know, hold on a minute. Let's think this over. Yeah, you know, all the minerals will be taken out, but you have to drain the muskets to, to do that. To get the road up there, uh, you know, what's the acreage uh, per square mile? I guess I have mile. to put hotel and flights on here too. Hmm. Uh, that will, uh, you know, displace uh, the muskeg uh, uh, when when they uh, when they put that road up there. And my main concern, and also, uh, you know, just not me, but uh, Shabby, is uh, when you do drain the muskegs uh, to get to the minerals. There's going to be this release of uh, tons and tons of methane gas that's going to escape into the atmosphere uh, because the bogs, the muskegs, 
you know, the peat moss, uh, the permafrost. Uh, when that disappears because of uh, the mining, there's going to be all of this release of methane gas because right now the breathing grounds uh, of our territory uh, up north, uh, we've lived with that for thousands and thousands of years since the Ice Age. And then uh, during the, uh, during the, the Muskegs, all, right now, uh, the, the muskeg is uh, floating in all this water, these bogs, and it contains and holds carbon uh, uh, right now. And it doesn't release the carbon just like uh, uh, the rainforest in Brazil. In Brazil, uh, the, the vegetation, the forest there holds uh, takes in uh, carbon, holds it for a while and then releases it. But up north uh, in the muskegs, that uh, uh, the carbon is, is held. It's like a, a huge uh, refrigerator and it doesn't release uh, the carbon into the atmosphere as methane gas. But uh, the hole in the ground, uh, at uh, Atoabska, of the, the uh, De Beers Mining Company that dug a hole there uh, to get to, to the diamonds. That hole is still there. Uh, and it's just like a, a huge uh, open wound to the land. And uh, you know it's uh, and and in my in my belief uh, is that it's, this is what's going to happen to our territory uh, between Webique and uh, Martin Falls, uh, Ogoki, uh, all that mining activity that's going on right now. Uh, what we're saying is put a hole on it because. Uh, we have our ways of, uh, of doing things, uh, the Anishinaabe people. And, uh, and that is where I said that uh, we need to go back and uh, listen to us in our languages. Uh, but, uh, you know, how, how to do this. They have all these major plans by uh, huge uh, mining companies and uh, corporations uh, that is that are going to benefit uh, because of the mining uh, that's going to be up there in in the Ring of Fire. Okay, they, they have these huge, huge uh, plans uh, uh, economically. We want to have we have these plans too, uh, in uh, uh, but we want it to happen in our own time, in our own ways, uh, in, uh, in language. Uh, because Chong uh, uh, Shibun, my, uh, my grandfather, before he died, uh, he was uh, uh, a cousin of mine, uh, told me about uh, what he said to, uh, to her. And uh, uh, one day uh, he, uh, he had a dream, he had a vision. And uh, uh, Chomish uh, 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 was, uh, was a visionary. Uh, he was a medicine man. He had, he had a, a medicine bundle. And, and we uh, always, always followed his, uh, his uh, advice, his teachings. And uh, he, in his dream and his vision, he said, one, one of these days, uh, this place that we live in now uh, is going to be a desert. And he says, uh, nothing but desert. So that's, uh, you know, 
That's what I always think about. Every time I think about the Ring of Fire and, and what's going to happen, uh, if it's uh, if it's uh, uh, done the way that uh, uh, that these consultants and uh, uh, corporations want to, want to do it now. But as the Nishinaabe, we say, oh, uh, just wait a minute here. I think uh, there's another way of. Uh, uh, of doing this, and there is, and, and we and and we do have that uh, Anishinaabe kandas when we have that Anishinaabe knowledge uh, to do that. And uh, so, that was uh, uh, his vision or his uh, uh, his prophecy to us. Uh, and that's what we have uh, in our uh, uh, mm, uh, what we think about uh, or as as this is happening to our territory uh, with uh, with the ring of fire. And if you uh, if you think this is bad for climate change. Uh, uh, wait until uh, you know they uh, they take out all this uh, uh, muskeg out there uh, uh, up north, and uh, you must remember that Essenishnabeg, uh, you know, uh, our uh, chiefs and elders, they, uh, the mining companies and the corporations wanted to build a huge uh, airfield. Uh, and the Ring of Fire, uh, north of Ugoki, uh, uh, at, at one time after the discovery of the Ring of Fire. But we put a stop to it, the, the Anishinaabe. We didn't want to have uh, that type of development that fast. Okay. Uh, it should be, uh, you know, that all, all Treaty 9 area uh, should be considered uh, a safe place, you know, for the planet. Uh, it should have uh, the United Nations uh, heritage site protection uh, for for all of that uh, area because it's going to affect the plants, the animals, the water, the air, and uh, the understanding up there. Uh, uh, Everything is going to. Uh, uh, everything is going to change. Oh, I have uh, Felicia to everyone. Uh, let me just get to this here. Is it possible, appropriate for non-Indigenous educators to support Indigenous language revitalization in their classrooms? If yes, how do you do this? Uh, it is possible, it is appropriate for non-Indigenous educators to support Indigenous language revitalization in their classroom. Of course, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's fine uh, to do that. Uh, remember, if you are not uh, 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 an Anishinaabe, specifically if you're not an, an Ojibwe, uh, learn the language uh, and uh, teach it to your students, uh, and uh, because that's part of the eighth fire prophecy, is that uh, this uh, Anishinaabe knowledge, Anishinaabe Kandaswan, is uh, is all in the, it's all in the languages. And when I was teaching uh, at uh, Western University, uh, teaching my indigenous language and culture course, Anishinaabe uh, language and culture course, all the non-natives would get mad of all, this, all the stuff that I was teaching them because uh, they would say, how come we were never taught all this stuff when we were in res uh, not residence, uh, when we were growing up uh, in, in the Ontario school system. Uh, uh, 
Yeah, it's because he didn't have Anishinaabe teachers. Uh, he didn't have, uh, you know, Anishinaabe fluent speakers. And, uh, and this is what uh, is, uh, is needed now, is to have uh, an Anishinaabe uh, initiative where we go back to the land and everything is taught in the languages, okay? Uh, uh, by fluent speakers. Uh, that way, you, you create an Anishinaabe economy uh, for, uh, for native language uh, knowledge keepers, uh, uh, native language uh, uh, speakers, Anishinaabe speakers. And that way, Ontario is going to benefit, Canada is going to benefit, but mostly Anishinaabe are going to benefit economically with the use of, uh, of, uh, of the language. And, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> I don't want to uh, sound, uh, you know, uh, gloomy, you know, talk about doom and all that stuff. Uh, but, you know, but at the rate that this planet is being used, uh, you know, pretty soon there's going to be, uh, you know, uh, drastic uh, uh, problems with the weather uh, for, for everybody. And uh, it's going to be, uh, you know, so bad that there's only going to be three li uh, life forms left on, on the planet. And those three life forms are going to be the insects, the Anishinaabe, and Keith Richards. Uh, for, <laughs> that's all that's going to be left. Uh, but that, I think, is going to be uh, something that we uh, need to discuss and talk. Uh, before, uh, uh, before we end, uh, I'd like to say that uh, to the Anishinaabe uh, Treaty 9, uh, we need to have a huge Anishinaabe gathering, a summit uh, in our traditional uh, territory. Uh, I know that there is a, a traditional meeting place, uh, Mount Jitat 91, uh, a meeting place uh, between uh, Ogoki and Fort Albany, and not just the uh, uh, an invite uh, everybody that's uh, that's going to be affected by the ring of fire, and have a huge uh, traditional meeting, uh, uh, Anishinaabe uh, summit using the language uh, to uh, to help people understand uh, our you know, our laws, uh, our responsibilities, our protocols, and uh, to uh, revitalize, <laughs> uh, bring back our Anishinaabe knowledge, our Anishinaabe Kandasa. So I'm proposing a huge uh, Anishinaabe meeting uh, uh, along uh, the Albany River there, uh, our traditional gathering place. And, and talk about uh, our future, our, uh, uh, our Anishinaabe uh, 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 future, and show and teach uh, uh, the Anishinaabe Kendas, uh, Anishinaabe uh, knowledge. I also need a new way. We can can the kid. Thank you for uh, listening, Kagi uh, about this uh, a little bit of uh, Anishinaabe Kendas uh, about the uh, the eighth fire. There's a lot of teachings about it, uh, and that uh, it should be discussed more in, in all our uh, educational uh, institutions, especially at Lakehead University. Uh, you're in the 
cusp of uh, uh, great change that needs to take place. And you need to have that, uh, you know, programs uh, all in Anishinaabe, like uh, have a have a huge Anishinaabe institution or Anishinaabe teachings on the land uh, in Treaty 9. Uh, and everything is in the language. And uh, you, have, you will have uh, teach the adults, the ones that went to residential school that forgotten the language and uh, that will really, really want to learn the language. Uh, I've had the parents uh, uh, that, uh, especially down here in southwestern Ontario, that do not know the language, that really, really want to know the language, uh, uh, the culture, all our songs, all our prayers, and uh, the laws, uh, Nishnabe laws, and all that stuff. And also, uh, uh, yeah, uh, welcome to all the kind words uh, <laughs> uh, for, from everybody that's uh, that uh, that came uh, uh, that came and talked. Okay, and uh, uh, somebody said that they're going to carry this forward and share it with that, uh, others. Uh, and that's uh, uh, be greatly appreciated uh, by uh, by us uh, to uh, spread the word, uh, share the teachings, and uh, uh, make uh, make the planet healthy again, and uh, make ourselves healthy again. Uh, uh, for uh, uh, for. Uh, for taking the time to uh, to listen to this, uh, Miigwech. Wow, Miigwech, thank you so much for sharing with us today. Um, I There is so much there and I, I mean, for those who are haven't noted, we have the same last name. Um, so it was nice to hear, um, you know, about Eli's grandfather, who would be my great grandfather. Um, and just, uh, you know, learning and listening and, and hearing some of those those, um, I will say, older stories, but certainly teachings that were passed down. And so Eli, part of the work that we're doing here um, in our in our region, and we're not the only ones doing it, it's a uh, multiple groups are working on language revitalization projects. Um, and those look different ways for different places. Some are on Zoom, like at the university here, we have um, twice um, monthly, we have a, a Zoom lesson. Uh, for a couple hours with a language speaker who comes from just up north near Geraldton. And uh, so people log on and they can spend an evening with, with her. Um, some of the other organizations uh, like Matawa have evening classes a couple days a week, which I believe um, your sister and a cousin are involved in. And that's really land-based teaching language. Uh, we also have classes here at the university where students can um, take a class like three hours a week, they can sign up for a language class in different years and different dialects as well. And, but, you know, with all that, I think on, on Zoom, we actually have some people from the public school board as well who are um, working with young people, but they're also working with each other to build to build languages. And I know we have Charlotte Nekaway on, um, and she is has been a language teacher in the school board for a long time, but also is a fluent speaker who carries that with her. And so my broader question is about, um, you know, as we have multiple organizations simultaneously working on language development, um, language retention, um, language awareness in some cases, how do you, and I know you yourself spent a number of years as a language instructor in a variety of places, um, and I have met some of your students over the years who, you know, talk great greatly about how much they enjoyed learning from you over those years um what kind of maybe advice do you have as we think about not only building the language but providing ways or inspiring people to think about becoming language teachers and in some cases that means learning the language and then you know pursuing that through through other like post-secondary means to become a, a teacher like yourself like you did 
A uh, uh, number of things uh, is that uh, I've, uh, I'm always uh, wanting uh, to, uh, to hear the language myself because I don't have anybody uh, to talk to uh, uh, in my elder years. <laughs> And uh, uh, there are Anishinaabe programs that need to be developed, that need to be funded, and uh, that need to uh, uh, come from uh, uh, the Anishinaabe communities and also for Anishinaabe communities. Uh, uh, one of the ways or one of the things I always uh, talk about is import and export uh, uh, the language where you say you have these uh, communities uh, down south here in southwestern Ontario okay where you have families uh, from up north uh, come and move in and live for three years as hosts in the community, and all they do is speak the language. And that's, you know, for adults, kids, uh, elders, that would hear the language. And, Eli, uh, sorry, we just uh, lost that. There was a buzz on the recording, so I yeah. missed what you said. I heard families from up north, and I think yeah, they're... Yeah, they're exporting the languages. You have uh, additional many family uh, units. Uh, from up north, uh, let's say, uh, uh, specifically uh, north of Sulaqa, north of uh, uh, Makina, uh, or even around the Makina area, because you have the Baxters, you have the Riches, you have the Munias, there's actually the British ones, uh, 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 Wigheads, uh, Yesmos, and you have all these families that have these traditional and Islamic territories up north. Okay. Uh, which people in, since 1948 are uh, called trap lines. Uh, yeah, those families go and live uh, in those trap, trap lines. Okay. And you, and you will create a program where they become the teachers, the instructors. And you have families from, let's say, down south, down here, that want to go and live up there for three years, let's say, uh, maybe even 10 years. And they and they bring their kids there, and their family units, like a, a grandmothers, grandfathers, aunts, uncles, uh, uh, mom and dads. They go up there and live the life that uh, you know that uh, us Baxters and Riches and all the families up north live through. And all they do is hear the language, like what we heard. Uh, uh, for three years, four years, five years, uh, whatever is sustainable. And then uh, there's families that would live up north with, uh, with the speakers in the traditional territories. Uh, they would teach everything, uh, uh, how to live off the land, that uh, the whole uh, hunting and gathering society, medicines, uh, stories, that's so canon and all that, okay? And then the, those families re would return to their communities and teach uh, uh, other families, uh, 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 family and friends that want that. And they become uh, uh, speakers too, and then they become uh, teachers. Even the kids that are up there for three years, five years, or six years. It's just like residential school, but in reverse. Because the federal government uh, and the churches uh, gave money to these uh, for the residential school system to operate uh, on our lands. So reverse the residential school mentality as part of this uh, truth and <laughs> reconciliation program and have uh, these families that are still living up north 
they become the professors, they become the teachers, all in the language. And uh, they, and, and not just Northern Ontario, but uh, do this in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, Quebec. And uh, if the students learn the language for five years, seven years, on the land, let's say they come from a, a southern community, okay? Uh, th that family uh, would become fluent speakers within five years, and then they would then they would return uh, to their uh, 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 home communities and teach uh, the people there. So they become teachers also. It's. Uh, it's like having or developing master speakers, let's say, uh, for, uh, for, for, the, for the language. Now, this uh, is uh, innovative. Uh, people would say, this is, oh, he's, the, he's, he's so innovative and, and stuff like this, right? But it's common sense, uh, you know. It's uh, let's say uh, an an Anishinaabe thought, okay, an Anishinaabe way of seeing things, an Anishinaabe way of uh, looking at things, uh, of having an Anishinaabe vision, and uh, uh, see the Anishinaabe communities would benefit from this. Uh, here in Canada, but the provincial government would benefit, the federal government would benefit. All the other Canadians would uh, would benefit from learning our knowledge also, okay? But even if Anishinaabe uh, people want to do this up north, there is there's a way of doing this uh, with using our traditional territories again, okay? Because if you take a look at the Baxter's traditional territory, what they call the trap line, okay? There's four families of Baxter's that own that land, okay? But I've heard, uh, but people have told me, uh, you know, my uh, cousin of mine that still goes there, he says, there's, you know the anim uh, the animals of you know they are uh, there's so many of them there now, okay that uh, <laughs> have taken over you know uh, the land that they're so nu numerous that uh, you know like uh, we used to cultivate uh, the animals for their fur and for clothing and all that stuff do that lifestyle again and create this Anishinaabe economy using our languages, uh, using our culture. Uh, because, you know, we didn't abuse the language, uh, uh, abuse the animals, okay? We said prayers uh, for and said thanks for giving their lives uh, uh, when we, every time we went uh, to, uh, 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 to benefit uh, from the animals, the plants. Like there was prayers for, for all of that. We had dreams, we had visions of uh, lives of animals. And uh, even at times if we were starving or, uh, you know, families have told stories that they would have dreams and visions of, uh, of animals and plants uh, telling us where the food for uh, at that time of need uh, uh, a long time ago. So there is, uh, so there is that. So there's so much uh, Anishinaabe knowledge, so much potential, so much educational uh, knowledge that is up there uh, that needs to be developed, uh, that needs to be developed by us uh, as, uh, you know, as Anishinaabe because Every Anishinaabe person, man, woman, child, elder, we're all educators, we're all protectors, 
uh, we're all providers, we're all educators, we're all healers. And uh, our, our traditional uh, teachings, uh, uh, we need to uh, uh, bring all of that front and center for everybody. And then, you know, we'd uh, have Anishinaabe families from down here go up north and live there for five, seven, six years. And the, the Anishinaabe families up there would benefit uh, from uh, giving those teachings. And then uh, that, and then the language would develop uh, orally uh, uh, as the way that we learned it as we were growing up uh, 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 up, uh, up north. And then slowly, uh, all of that knowledge, uh, uh, all of that uh, Anishinaabe teachings, Anishinaabe kindasma would move from the north in those northern communities and then all of that knowledge would move down south where all the language, uh, all the languages have been lost by uh, communities. When I first came to Chippewa of the Times First Nations, there was only a handful of uh, speakers left and they were all elders. And while I was teaching there, you know, they all, uh, they all passed on to the spirit world. And uh, there is no, uh, you know, there are no longer speakers. But then there are some people that really, really uh, had the, the tenacity to go and learn the language and bring it back to their community. Uh, because it's still, uh, 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 because the language is still out there. And uh, you have people in the States that still speak the language and they would benefit from, from that too and stuff like that, right? Uh, all, you, all you need to do is find funds uh, from rich Anishinaabe from the States and uh, kind-hearted people from all over the world that would, uh, you know, know of our crisis uh, in, in losing the language and uh, and funds uh, would come from uh, from kind-hearted people uh, from uh, all over the world, even here in Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, a lot of people would give funds for this type of program, and uh, but it's never been done before. And uh, uh, the potential is there uh, for for this type of uh, knowledge to expand and uh, be, uh, be known by, uh, by everybody uh, with, uh, 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 with our resources, uh, with the language, with the culture, with uh, our Anishinaabe uh, uh, Kandaswan, uh, that that needs to be uh, 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 developed. Uh, see, we don't need to have research and uh, studies done or, or any of that stuff. Uh, see, the, the language encompasses all that stuff, all that knowledge and, uh, and uh, uh, the curriculum. Everything mm -hmm. is laid out in the, la uh, in, in the language. Especially in the oral language, right? Because uh, we have ceremonies that needs to uh, uh, that needs to uh, be uh, you know uh, taught in, uh, to uh, uh, individuals right. and our medicines and uh, you know uh, our ideas to you know to, uh, save the planet because we <laughs> are. are uh, land keepers, right. and uh, we have uh, and we have that responsibility. That sounds like the perfect <clears throat> final statement, um, and and we do. And I'm so honored that you are uh, sharing that with us and acting on that. 
and have given us quite a comprehensive uh, place to continue our reflection and action on. Um, so I'd like to say Chimi Glitch for speaking with us um, today, and I'd like to introduce uh, President McPherson to present uh, something for you. Oh, Chris. Yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much, Denise and uh, Eli. Thank you very, very much for a captivating, interesting, and really valuable talk today. I know I was watching the um, the chat messages, and I know people were really listening to your your comments and thinking about them and. I found the talk today so interesting because, of course, it's based in this region, so connected to the things that we're thinking about and watching and, and for me, listening and, and learning about. So thank you so much for a, an excellent talk. And we, on behalf of Lakehead University and all of the individuals that are involved in hosting this speaker series, wanted to um, thank you with a certificate of invited lecturer and you know, obviously, this is just a very small token of our appreciation for you being part of our global Indigenous speaker series. So thank you very much. We look forward to deepening our relationship with you in the future. And on behalf of Lakehead University, thank you, Miigwech. And before everybody signs off, I also once again want to thank Anna. Um, thank you, Elder Jean, for for being with us today, and and Denise, and everybody that's been involved in 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 pulling these uh, amazing talks together throughout the year. Thank you. Great, Miigwech. Thank you. Um, and I also, uh, before we have Elder Jean do our closing, uh, would like to just in, uh, invite you to check your email shortly. We will be doing a draw for five copies of Eli's most recent uh, nonfiction book. And Elder Jean, welcome back. I'd like to invite you to do our, our closing for today. You're now unmuted, Elder Jean, so you should be all right. I'm good. Okay, thank you. Jimmy Goet, Eli. Yeah, yet. Monotso here. It's been an honor to listen to you. And, uh, and uh, I guess. Uh, just collaborating what you shared today and uh, and, and uh, it really speaks in, in my heart uh, is the work vitalization languages and, and tradition and culture right so Jimmy Gutch just a short closing prayer that make sure everybody anybody traveling today they get home safe uh -huh. some of show us Miigwech which no more book this demand you book this demand where uh so get to show us who we need uh and uh no say the key and the key and we reach out to it we started where much so in the much to one we show us to me which to me which thank you everyone have a good day thank you so much and uh Eli Always a pleasure. I'll see you later. Uh, there's no word uh, goodbye in Ojibwe, so we just say uh, and I'll see you later. And uh, I like to take, uh, say, get uh, you uh, Lakehead University. Uh, uh, Denise. And uh, Anna, uh, Dr. Uh, McPherson, at the Skin Uichi Wagon, Jean, you guys for your Thank you for uh, uh, for doing this, and also uh, thanks uh, for having me. And uh, just uh, before I leave, I uh, just let everybody know that uh, 
uh, I'm writing my uh, second book, uh, Book Dirt. Uh, so uh, it's about uh, my adventures at the Lakehead University, uh, Thunder Bay. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, uh, places, places like that. So uh, uh, you uh, you might find yourself in uh, in book der, <laughs> book uh, book. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Okay, thank you so much uh, everyone, um, for joining us. Gengabab, my menway. Amira, figa, amigos.